Morning. Good morning. Morning. Morning, Mr. Morning, Captain. Uh, <laughs> here we go. I'll share my screen with you. Okay, and then uh, let's see. I also want to see the chat. Hide that. All right. Me measures of variability. Great. There's a problem up there. You can try to read what range is and then see if you can answer the problem. Okay. There. Can I type my answer in the chat? That would be great. Good morning, Mr. Rosenthal. Good morning. Mr. Rosenthal. Good morning. Oh. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. I did not get the range of 30. I got 28. Put your answer in the chat. Then I can respond. While you're waiting, go ahead and see if you can make, get a mean, median, and mode also. Okay, mostly you're getting that range value, correct. Again, uh, whether the range is uh, large or small depends on what you're talking about. Things could be thousands of units apart and still have a small range relative to the problem, right? If you're talking about um, light years, certain distances, uh, astronomical distances, then a thousand extra feet or a difference of a million feet even is not if things come within 1 million feet of each other when you're speaking in light years, that's super close. So it really is in the context of the problem. You have to remember that. I'm confusion. What are you confusion about? Some people are now coming in with the median. Zara has a median value. I'm not sure if that's it, but we'll, we'll look at it. So we'll find range, mean, median, mode. Sir Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. How it says the ranges of a set is the difference between the greatest and least values. Yeah, So that's true. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that be 30? What's the greatest value that you see? 40. Uh, that's not one of the values. The values are the dots, not the number. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, that makes sense to me how you would think that. 
Good, the modes, I see some people putting in the modes. That is not a 28 that those two dots are over. It's 29. How about the mean? Did anybody get the mean? Uh, some people are saying the median's 22. Somebody else said it was 25. They're right next to each other, so. And I haven't done the problem yet, so I'm not sure. Somebody said the mean is 22. I wonder if they think that the mean and median, they're switching them. I don't know. I haven't done it. We're going to start in just a short second here, though. All right, 10 o'clock, good morning, everybody. We're gonna be talking about variability. The word vary is to change. Um, so from one data point to another, they're not all the same. If you're just getting the same data every time, 25, 25, 25, 25, variability would be zero. So as points start to change from one data point to the next, you get what's called variability. And we wanna measure that. We wanna see, um, are you getting a whole bunch of different outcomes? Or are you getting the same outcome every time? Or are you getting similar outcomes every time? Or are you getting a, a vast array of outcomes that are all over the place, all right? And so you can kind of think why that's important when you do statistics is in the predictability. We talked about functions, right? Functions have that predictability factor, okay? Now, so does statistics, except it's not um, deductive the way that math is. One plus one is two. Through any two points, there is only one line and exactly one line. Okay. But with statistics, you're looking at how the data is behaving in, on average. It's not a, that's not a physics problem or a math problem like one plus one is two. That doesn't mean it's not useful to take data and try to understand what's happening with the data. So you could see you want to use data to as a predictor. Now in the world, in economics, and uh, maybe with this virus and things like that, what's going to happen? Nobody knows because you can't apply math to it that way. We can apply math to give us predictability. And when the data is all over the place, it's harder to predict what's going to happen. And if the data is close to one value, it's easier to predict that your outcome is going to be close to that value. So that's kind of the importance of range and measuring how far apart your data are. Okay, so measures of variability are used to describe the distribution. We call it a data distribution. How are the data spread? Okay, uh, once one measure of variability is the range, we're going to do other measures of variability. You could probably come up with what else would be useful. This one range is simply how far apart the biggest value is from the smallest value. Nothing is bigger than the biggest value. Nothing is smaller than the smallest value. You know that nothing goes below and nothing goes above those values. And then you want to see how far apart they are. But what are some other important things you could do with data? In terms of variability, how the data is spread out. What are some examples or some things that you can do with that? Anybody have any ideas? What would you do if the 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 um, there was like infinitely bigger amount of numbers and like infinitely amount, smaller amount of numbers? Then it's going to be hard to determine. You know, the data then doesn't help you to predict anything because you don't know. But it could be that things that well, if it's infinite, and how would you have a data set with infinite data? I mean, like if you had if the um, over a certain period, if you were like counting over a certain period of time, and it's like if you if you were in the weather business and um, you were there is the taking hottest the temperature, temperature on record and a coldest the temperature on record temperature right? every day, but at starting the first day of the year and every day after the first day of the year, the temperature gets progressively uh, progressively colder. 
Yeah, but when you lay out the data of all the days you recorded, you're going to have a lowest temperature and you will have a highest temperature. Okay. Right? Um, I'm thinking something that's going to be difficult to come up with on your own, but an important measure of variability is going to be what's called the standard deviation. Uh, and then the mean absolute deviation we're going to study. So those things are talking about we know how far apart the farthest and the, the lowest are. What about all the ones in between? Okay, so how, how closely are all the ones in between to the middle, right? So when we do that, we're gonna find out are, are most of the data close to the center or are most of the data spread out? Are they away from the center? Um, is the range really big and the data is equally distributed throughout? They're all spaced evenly apart. Or are they jumbled up in one location or another, right? So those are the kinds of the different ways that we're gonna look at variability. Um, you know, because you know, the averages can only get to the middle can only tell you so much. It tells you a valuable, it's the most valuable thing um, at, your, at your level now is finding out what averages are. That's the number one thing in statistics is the average. So we've already done that. Now it's going to be to get more detailed in finding out what's happening with the data is how it's spread out. All right, so let's get to it. The largest value here is at 38. It's the dot above 38. So we're finding the range. Okay, 38 minus the lowest value is 10. So the range is 28. There, so the data is, the, is spread out 28 units apart. So all the data falls within a range of, of 28. Okay, um, now uh, let's see. It describes whether the data are spread out or clustered. Okay, that's fine. Um, some other values we can come up with is mode would be, which ones stand out more? It would be 10 happened twice, 29 happened twice. So 10 and 29 would be the mode. The median, you'd have to order them from least to greatest. So how many data points are there here? One, two. 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15 data points. So that would be the eighth data point. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That is the middle data point. So 22 is the median. The mean, you'd have to add them up. So we have 10, 20, that's 32, 45, 45 and 16 is 61, plus 17, 78, okay, plus 18, 96, that's going to be uh, 118, 143, 169, I'm getting tired, 169, plus uh, 29, plus 29, plus 31, plus 32, plus 38. We'll do the rest that way. 27, 28, 38. 9, 11, 13, 16, 19, 22. 328 divided by 15. Okay, so 15. Okay, and then that's gonna go in uh, eight times. Okay, 80, 120. That's going to go in six times and we'll round to the nearest tenth. So 21, about 21.9. So the mean is about 21.9. Okay, so if you look here, where is that? 21.9 is really close to 22, isn't it? As a matter of fact, if you rounded to the nearest hole, it would be 22. So here the mean and the median were about in the same place. And what that means is the data is distributed quite evenly, all right? Half the data is to the left of that. Half the data is to the right of that. But it's not that most of these are all down towards the bottom is going to make the mean come down. If this data is piled up high, those higher numbers are going to move the mean to the right. They're going to make the average bigger. The fact that the mean is very nicely here either means that if this is grouped up to the right, then this to counteract it, think of a balance scale. If you push all your weight out from the fulcrum, 
right? And you leave all this weight evenly distributed like this, and you slide all your weight to the end, your scale's gonna tip. Because remember how we said the further you are from the fulcrum on a lever, the more force, downward force you're gonna get, right? So if I squeeze all this data out also, it will balance it. If I evenly distribute the data to the left of the middle, then I evenly distribute the data to the right of the middle, it will be balanced also. So having the mean be close to the median means that on the, what's happening to the left is about the same as what's happening to the right. And then when you look at it, you see it's not piled up, it's spread out nicely, and the right is spread out nicely. Okay, so this is a nice spread out distribution. It's very symmetrical looking. It's not perfectly symmetrical. Okay, all right. Let's go to another example. Okay, let's look at B. Got to be careful not to show the answer because I took pictures and the answers are right there. Okay, so here we go. We'll go down very slowly here. Right there. The age and years of Mrs. Tisnik's grandchildren, 27, 8, 5, 19, 21, 10, 4, and 21. Just find the range, please. Don't do mean, median, and mode. Just do the range. It's very quick. Put it in the chat. I got this is the low and that's the high. So I have that as my range. Charlie, you see that? The largest value is 27. The lowest value is four. Four, lowest, 27 highest. Okay, subtract those to get the range. Any questions about the range? Nobody? How about this one? What's the range? Go. Are you talking about B? Or B, yeah. Okay, okay. 20, I thought, 27 minus four. I thought you were talking about uh, the last the last one was not 30 though. Yeah, no, I thought you were talking about A. A is not 30 either. It isn't? No, because it's not the, what's the last number on the number line. It's the last dot. And the last dot oh. is 38. The first dot is 10. Yeah, it's not between, it's not the numbers on the number line that matter, it's where the dots are. Okay, okay. So this one's gonna be 58. Minus 33, 25. It shows the answer on the problem. Yeah, it does. But calculate it anyway. See if you can get the answer in there. Okay, it tells you the answer is 16, but can you calculate it to be 16? So how do you get 16? It's the 25 is the largest value and the smallest value is 9 and that's how you get your 16. $16 range in, in um, DVD prices. Prices range. The range is 16. It's a $16 range. Any questions so far? Wait, did, did we do 1A? Or yeah. did we we did. Wait, so we do 58 minus 33? Uh-huh. And you could see it there in red. Yeah, it tells and, you. Yeah, and you get 20. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something else if nobody has questions. We're going to talk about something called quartiles. All right, so if you look, it says in a set of data, data. the quartiles are the values that divide the data into, what do you think quartile, what's the, what's the prefix there? Uh, four. Quarters, right? So if you take a football game or a basketball game, you, the game has a starting point, right? 
that's going to be your minimum value. Then your game is whatever length your game is, that's when the game ends. Well, one of the uh, one of the markers that marks the game is the halftime, right? And then you have the first quarter, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter, right? When the quarter ends, the buzzer usually goes off and you take a break. There's usually a break between quarters. Okay, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at my screen, it's different than what they're showing. They're not showing it that way, but yet they are. They are, and this is the connection. In a football game, all of the, in an NFL game, these are all 15 minutes. They're all the same length, the quarters are, okay? So when we do it with our data, you have to have the same amount of data in each quarter, okay? Now we're not gonna call them quarters. It's gonna sound just like quarters. We're gonna call them quartiles. So quarter and quartile, very similar. You're gonna call them quartiles. This is the first quartile. This is the second quartile. This is the third quartile and the fourth quartile, okay? Now, um, let's look at what they actually are. Okay, so in a set of data, the quartiles are the values that divide the data into four equal parts. Recall that the median of a set of data separates the set in half, okay? So halfway would be the median. That is the value where half of the values in the data set are below it, and half of them are above it. It's right in the middle. So if I have um, 10 data points, Five will be in the lower half, five will be in the upper half. If I have 11 data points, then the sixth data point is in the middle, and then you have five to the left and five to the right. Okay, so if you have an even amount of data points, you have to average out the two in the middle, right? Okay, and then if you have an odd amount of data points, the one in the middle is the one in the middle, and then you have an even amount to the left and an even amount to the right. But a quarter, the quarter marker, the end of the first quarter, called the first quartile, that is going to be right in the middle from the beginning to the halftime. That means for the first half of the game, half of the time played is in this first section here, and the other half of the time is here. So for data sets, half of the data has to be below this and half of the data has to be above this up until the first half, up until the median. So you're basically cutting in half and then cutting in half again to make quarters, right? Cut a sandwich in half and then cut it in half again the other way. And you're, that's how you create quarters, right? Well, that's how we're creating quartiles. Now it's a little bit different here watch this. You have the median. This point, the end of the first quarter in a football game, is called the first quartile. The end of the second quarter, it would be the second quartile. We don't have something called the second quartile. That's the median. The median is quartile number two, the second quartile. The end of the third quarter is the third quartile. The fourth quartile would be the end of the game, the end of the data. It would be the largest data point. The beginning of the game is the first data point. These are gonna be called the extremes. That's the lower extreme. This is the upper extreme. Some people call the third quartile, another name for it is the upper quartile. Another name for the first quartile is the lower quartile. We don't usually refer to the median as the second quartile, so we eliminate that. We don't call this the fourth quartile, we eliminate that. We don't call this the zeroth quartile. It's just the lower extreme and the upper extreme, okay? 
and that, and then let me get rid of these. And now all of a sudden we've transformed our football game into what we're doing here with the data. We're splitting the data into quarters is how we're doing it. The median splits it in half. Half of the median is the first quartile. Then the upper one is from the median to the upper extreme. You cut that in half to get your upper quartile. Or you can call them the first and the third. Where did the second go? It's in the middle. It's, in the, it's the median. It's half time. Everybody got it? So here's the lower half of your data up to the median and the upper half of your data. Questions? And then later on, there'll be, we'll pay attention to only data that is between the first and the third quartile. What if I only want data that's in here? Only measure data that's in there. So what is a prefix for between, between something? Me. Like if there's a freeway that goes in between states, you call that a what type of freeway? Interstate. Interstate, oh. right? Hi. Inter means between, right? So there's a, there's a name here, between the first and the third quartile. If I only want to look at data between the first and the third, because all the other data is not close to the middle, I'm, I'm basically zooming in on only data that's close to the middle. Then the name for that is inter, and what am I between? I'm between the quartiles. So it's called the interquartile range. And that's just the third quartile minus the first quartile. Instead of this, minus, the highest minus the lowest, that's the range. You can do the interquartile range would be the uh, upper quartile minus the lower quartile. And that would give you just the distance between those two. Okay. Any questions about that? All right. So uh, one more clarification. This lower quartile is the median of the first half of the data. Okay. Any questions about that? If there's an odd amount of data and you have a median in the middle, a single number that you didn't have to average, this would be the median of the leftover. It would not include that other median. However, if it's an even amount of data, like 10, you'll have five data here and five data here, then it's okay. You're gonna include the, that fifth data point will go with the lower part, and the sixth data point will go with the upper, and you'll actually take the, the median of the separate halves, okay? But if it's an odd amount of data, like 11, data point number six is isolated in the middle. The one through five, you're gonna find the median of the first five. And then um, seven through 11, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, those five, seven through 11, you'll find the median of those, set, those five data points. But the sixth data point will not be part of finding the median, okay? And so the median of the lower half is the first quartile. The median of the upper half is the third quartile, okay? There was a lot there, so we'll have to work with it. Let's see what we have underneath. Oh yeah, they just talked about interquartile range here. See it? Interquartile range is the range of the middle half of a set of data. It is the difference between the third and first quartiles, Q3 minus Q1. Any questions so far? Okay, let's move along. Wait, I have a question. Yes. If each quarter of a football game is only 15 minutes and there's four quarters, so that's only an hour, why, why are football games so long? Timeouts and uh, clock stoppages. They stop the clock when it's a dropped pass. They stop the clock when it goes out of bounds. They also have stop overtime. The clock during a timeout. They stop the clock for commercial breaks. So that extends the game. Otherwise, it wouldn't be. If they never stop the clock, like soccer, then it would be, um, and they didn't take breaks at the quarters, or even if they did take breaks at the quarters, it would be 60 minutes plus whatever break time they were going to take at, at the quarter marks and at the, at the halftime. Okay. All right, so 
find the measures of variability for the data in this table. So here's this table that you have. I want you to find, try not, you can, you can look at step one and two if you need help, but I would not look at it. Just look at the table there um, and try to give the measures of variability. So give me the range, um, give me the lower extreme, the upper extreme, give me the median. I want the first quartile, the third quartile, and I want the interquartile range. That's what I want. Okay, so let me mark, say what I want. I want the range, I want the lower extreme, I want the upper extreme, I want Q1, I want Q3, and I want interquartile range. Please, go. U.S. Summer Olympic silver medals. Are the Olympics still happening? I don't think so. I don't know. No, it's postponed. Bro, what do you think? Literally, almost everything is postponed till so twenty. Like the first time in like. Our math lessons are not postponed. <laughs> I, everything but. I said almost everything. Yeah, so. that's true. What do you mean? Okay. Caleb. Or it's completely canceled. I'm going to write these data sets here. 1976 to 2008. Oh, it's because the Olympics are every four years. So let's see. 76, 80, 84, 88, 92, 96, 2000, 2004, 2008. Yeah, that's nine different Olympics. That's why there's nine different score, uh, amounts of medals for the U.S. There's also the Winter Olympics. But this, if you look at the chart, it's only for the summer. Oh, okay. So look what I, what do you think the first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to list this from zero, I'm going to list this from least to greatest. Okay, zero, any single digit? No. Any double digit in the teens? No. How about in the two, 20s? Wow, look at that one year, 61 medals. That's, wow. Okay, 24, that's the only one in the 20s. Lots in the 30s. So I got 31, 32, 34, 35, 31, 32, 34, 35. Look at all the data piles up right there. This is definitely an outlier here. Zero medals, wow. I don't think we attended. I think that one was yeah, it uh, must in have been, Russia. It, it must have been we didn't attend, yeah. 31, 32, 34, 35, 38, 39. I'm not things. They probably could just put numbers in here. And then it jumps to 61. Maybe one of our best competitors didn't show up that year. I don't know. What the heck happened there? Somebody could Google that. When did we earn 61 silver medals? Well, these aren't gold medals, but still, that's a lot of silver medals. Maybe it's because we didn't do as, maybe it's because we didn't get as many gold medals. So maybe that doesn't mean that we had as much success. I don't know. Okay, anyway, see what you do with data. That's what you do with data. You start looking at it and getting meaning from it. That's the most important thing to do with all this data. Now, all these things that we're learning give you different tools for doing that, and they make you come to different realizations about the data. All right, so we're doing this so that you guys can start looking at data and coming up with different ideas of what it's, the data is actually telling you. Okay, that's why this is so important. All right, let's answer what the range is. 61 minus zero is 61. Lower extreme is zero. Upper extreme, 61. Okay. Oh, I didn't put median. I need, let's just do median. I have nine different Olympics here. So halfway would be five. So one, two, three, four, five. What's the other method I showed you? Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Here's our median. Okay, half of the Olympics, the other than the median, the other half, uh, half of the other uh, uh, years are above and half are below. That's what it means to be the median. Half of the data is above, half of the data is below. 
okay? Now that, you're done with that because it's an odd and it's only one in the middle. You're not gonna be using that 34 anymore. I am gonna find now the lower half and the upper half, I'm gonna treat them as their own separate data sets, okay? So I'm gonna find the median of this even amount, there's four here, is gonna be the average of these two. So the average of 24 and 31 is 27 and a half. How did I get it? You could add them together and divide by two is the long way. What I do is I say, oh, these are seven apart. 31 minus 24 is seven, right? Then halfway is half of seven is three and a half. So I just added three and a half to 24. So that gave me 27.5. That is Q1, or my lower quartile. And then I'll do the same thing here. Oh, these are close together. 38.5 is right in the middle. And that is Q3, or my upper quartile. Wait, so the Q1 and Q3 is the average of the two middle ones? Not, uh, yes, if there's an even amount. If there were five data points uh, down here, it would have just been the one in the middle. So it, 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 it's simply, if you want to put it simply, it's the median of the lower half of data. Yeah. And the upper quartile is the median of the upper half of the data. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. And then last, the interquartile range is the same as the regular range, but you're doing it with the quartiles. So this looks like they're 11 apart. So IQR is 11. So, and they refer to this as the middle half of the data. Half of the data is in between, right? Is in between these. This half of the data is between those. The other half of the data is out, is either lower or higher than those quartiles. So it's the middle half of the data. So now you have the upper half of the data, the lower half of the data, the middle half of the data. And then you have the outer parts of the data, right? We don't even talk about those. The outer, they're on the outskirts, okay? But the interquartile range is the, the middle half of the data. Okay? Any questions? No? You guys are quiet this morning. Y'all. Y'all. It's because we're so smart. We just like immediately understand everything. Smart, cause... smart. Okay. Yeah. This definitely. other problem, the next problem I'm going to show you is going to have all the answers, but you have to try to calculate them yourself. <laughs> so you're going to be doing what I do here on the next problem for to try, but the answers are all going to be there. You have to see if you can get them though. Why do they look the same? Oh, some of them are, the, are similar. Okay, so here we go, ready? Marley's paper airplane tosses in feet, how far they went. Okay, find all the measures. I know that they're there in pink, okay? Oh, what's this thing it says? I like this little chart, the mystery note. A small interquartile range means that the data in the middle of the set are close in value. A large interquartile range means that the data in the middle are spread out or vary. Yeah. I'm gonna leave all those. I'm missing the median here, but we know about that. You're gonna need it. Yay, I'm gonna order from least to greatest. Airplane tosses, nothing, oh, there's something, oh, in the 20s. An airplane going 53 feet, wow. Well, it caught some wind. Yeah. Oh, there's 38 and 39. And then 40. You can kind of see when the data starts to jumble up, you can kind of see what the average throw is. By where the data is starting to pile up. It's piling up in the, you know, in the 40s. So this kid, in a normal throw, it's like when you do a Rubik's Cube solve. You might get your fastest solve on accident, 
but it's not really how fast you solve the cube on average. So you want to see what your cube times are. The same type of thing could happen. You can get a 25 second solve, but most of your times are somewhere around the same amount. And if you, if you want to know if you're getting better at it, it's not by it, what your fastest time is. It's kind of by where your average time is. That would be a good data set, by the way, is to do cube, cube solve times. Uh, 53. Now, in this case, that's the, that's the farthest. Okay, range. 53 minus 25 is 28. If you, ask, you want to ask me at any time where I got that number, that's fine. The lower extreme is 25. The upper extreme is 53. Those are all really simple to get. Okay, median, you noticed I don't have median here, but I can't find Q1 or Q3 or IQR until I find the median. And it looks like we have eight data points, which means they're gonna be two in the middle. The fourth and the fifth are gonna be in the middle. Four. Okay, so the median is gonna be 42. It's got to be the average of 40. Why is it, why is it 42? Like, because we learned how, yesterday how you, that the, the median, if there's two values in the middle of the data, because there's an even amount of data, then you have to average them. How do you, do you average them by adding them together and then dividing them by? Two. That, that works. You can do that. I just find the number that's directly in the middle of 40 and 44. I got. I, I tried it and I got uh, 64. How did you do it? 40 plus 44? Yeah. Divided. What is that? That's 84. 84 divided by 2. 44. 42. It literally says 64 on my calculator. I don't know why. <laughs> You punched it in wrong because the calculator cannot give you a wrong value. Okay, here we go. You might be doing, oh, I know it. I think I know what you're doing. You might be doing 40 oh. plus 44 divided by 2. Yeah. Which is adding 22 to the 40, giving you 60. Yeah. I didn't press equals. Yeah. We have a new amount of people today. We have 64. Yes, okay, bring your friends. Okay, here we go. Now, this is gonna change slightly from the last problem because now uh, the lower half of your data, you might want to put box it in, includes the 40. And the upper half of your data includes the 44. Oops, I went through the numbers. Okay, so now when I find the, the low, the, okay, so now I'm gonna find Q1, it's going to be the average of 38 and 39, which is 38.5. There's Q1. And the upper half of the data, these are in the middle. And the number right in between 45 and 49 is 47. And that's my Q3, or my upper quartile. Lower. Mr. Rosenthal, but if you have an odd number of numbers, how do you find the... Then you'll have one median. And then all the, the data that's below it, you find the median. Data that's above it, you find the median. Okay. That was the, last, that was the first problem we did. There was, an, there was a, an odd amount, right? There were nine, nine different Olympic years that we did. Right? Yeah. Oh, I, I see that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now Q1 is 38.5. Q3 is 47. IQR means you just subtract them. Okay, so you have eight, eight and a half. So your inner quartile range means that the, for the middle half of the data is between those values here. Half of the data for the whole set of this kid throwing the, the, the paper plane, half of the data is between the, the is in, in the interquartile range and with, is, has a range of eight and a half feet, all right? So if you're just talking about his throws that are close to his average, that range is a range of eight and a half feet. Now, what importance that has is up to the person doing it. You know, uh, is that a lot or is that a little bit? In terms of paper throwing, it's a very inaccurate art. So maybe eight and a half feet 
apart from the furthest average throw, you know, to the lowest average throw, low average, you could think of it as low average, high average, but all of it's average. Maybe you want to think about interquartile range as, a, as an average range. You know, uh, when you go to the doctor and they do blood samples, um, they, you're supposed to have different makeups of chemicals in your body, at certain salt levels, certain electrolyte levels, things like that. It, you're never going to have people come and have the necessarily one healthy level. It's a range that you fall in. If your cholesterol is within a certain range, there is a healthy or normal range. It's when you fall outside of that range, but you could be the upper end of that range and you could be at the lower end of the range, but you're still in the average, the whole range here, the IQR is all part of the average range, right? So you could probably call the IQR, the interquartile range, the average range, right? We can make our own name for it and say that's the average range, right? If you fall anywhere in there, you're an average paper plane thrower, right? If, you, if your average happens to be below this range, if you're below here, um, you need to learn, you need to improve your skills on making paper planes. If you're above the average range, then you're, you're a gifted, you're a gifted paper plane maker, <laughs> right? Uh, or you could have had lost practice. What? You could oh, have also had lots yeah, of practice. Sure. Okay, let's look at this next thing here. This says, data that are more than one and a half times the value of the interquartile range beyond the quartiles are called outliers. I've never heard of that before. I've heard of outliers. I never knew that there was a number that told you what actually makes an outlier. So let's look at that again. I, I'm learning something new here too. Data that are more than one and a half times the value of the interquartile range beyond the quartiles. Okay, so here, what was our interquartile range? It was eight and a half. So what's one and a half times that? Eight and a half times one and a half. 9.75. You got it? Okay, 9.75. If you are 9.75 above the upper quartile, what would that be? So the upper quartile was 47. Add 9.75 to that to get 56.75. And it says if you are more than that. So that's the highest you can be is 56.75. Is that an outlier, yes or no? Yeah, 56.75. Yes or no? No. No, because it's got to be more. It has to be more than, not more than or equal to, right? So that is, the, that is the largest number that you can be without being an outlier for this data set. What's the lowest number you can be without being an outlier? You would take this 9.75 away from 38.5. So if I, let's see. 29.5, right? That is the smallest number that you can be before you're considered an outlier. So that is not an outlier. So 25 is an outlier? Yes, so 25 is an outlier. This is cool. I never learned that before. Okay, um, and then uh, 56, so we don't have any upper outliers. We only have a lower outlier, okay? So that's cool. We found now they're probably gonna give us problems to try to identify outliers mathematically like this. And you're gonna need the interquartile range to do it. And you're gonna need the upper quartile and the lower quartile to get that. And then once you get that, you add that to your upper quartile to get that the maximum and the minimum, you subtract from your lower quart quartile to get your minimum. Outside the minimum and the maximum, if you go outside those, you are an outlier, okay? It's one and a half times, it's one and a half, wait a minute, that's not right. One and a half times eight and a half is not 9.75. No, one eight and a half is eight and a half. Half of eight and a half is 4.25.
So it should have been 12.75. Sorry, I did it quickly without the calculator. Oh, I thought you used a calculator. Okay, no. so that changes this, hold on. Sorry. That's okay. Let me go back and change it. That would make this 59.75. So we still do not have an outlier. That's the maximum you could be without being an outlier. So no upper outliers. Then if we subtract 12.75 here, let's see, let's subtract 12, you get 26.5. So you get 25.75. That's the minimum. Well, 25 is still below that, so it's still an outlier. Just barely. Okay. All right, let's see if we can, if they give us some problems to do for that. Yes, find any outliers of the data set. I think next time I'll take pictures and not include, I'll crop it so it doesn't include the solutions because I think the temptation is, is gonna be too much for some of you. Wait, so the way you find out if it's an outlier is- One and a half times the interquartile range. You have to take one and a half times the interquartile range and add it to the third quartile and subtract it from the first quartile to, oh, get, to get these maximum and minimums. Okay. It's not the, ma it's not the extreme. It's, it's the maximum it could be before it becomes an outlier. Okay, so don't follow these steps. Follow your own steps. These are animal speeds. <laughs> in miles per hour. Squirrel, turkey. Wow, an elephant can run 25 miles an hour? They do trample people, so. A, a cat can run 30 miles per hour? Yep. A reindeer can run faster than a cat. What's so great about this data, by the way? You find out new things about um, topics. It's in order. I like that it's, in, it's already in order. This data probably isn't Accurate. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, cats have some trouble catching squirrels. If they go that much faster, they probably wouldn't have nearly as much trouble as they probably do. Squirrels not moving in a straight line. Oh. Haven't, you, haven't you chased somebody on the yard before? And they keep twisting and turning directions to, so that they don't get caught? Because um, your velocity is a vector, okay? So you could be running a constant speed but change your direction and you have to change your velocity because you're changing the direction. I was wrong. This is accurate. I looked it up. Yeah. All right. What do I need to find the outliers? I need the IQR, the first Q1 and Q3. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of data. That means the fourth one is the, is the median. Okay, so then, oh, look at this. This is Q1 all by itself. This is Q3 all by itself. Because there's an odd amount in the lower half. See that, Everett? Here there was an odd amount to begin with, seven. So you had one median. But then that leaves three here, which is odd, and three here. So you don't have to do any averaging out. Okay, so the IQR is 35 minus 15, which is 20. And one and a half times that is what I add and subtract from Q1 and Q3. So it's going to be 30. Okay, so I'm going to add 30 to my 35. So my upper maximum and my lower maximum, oh my my lower minimum, I should just call it my max and min. It's your upper extreme and your lower extreme. It's, it's, oh, did it end up being that? Let's see, no it's not, no it's not. If I add 30 to 23, I get 65. If I subtract 30 from- Wait, 15, where did you get 30 from? I got 30, it's one and a half times the IQR. Oh, okay. Okay. If I subtract 30 from 15, I get negative 15. Okay, so I do not have any values lower than negative 15. I do have a value that's above 65. So this is my outline right here. 
The only outlier is 70 because it is greater than 65. You use this section of a textbook to check your work, by the way. When you guys get to college, you're on your own, okay? You're gonna go through textbooks. Don't ever give yourself the answer and look at the, I didn't look at it. You try to do the problem and then you use that to check. And if you had a problem or you were making an error, you would see that happen here when you checked it. And that would make you come to a realization. You would get feedback. If you use the textbook properly, it's a powerful tool for you. Wait, so it's, ne it's negative 15 for the minimum? Um, like that you can go- Yeah, anything lower than negative 15 would be an outlier for this data set. Okay. So there's basically, since you can't go negative with animal speeds, um, that's not practical. Um, an animal cannot be have an outlier speed that's a that's a, a because it's too small. You can't go more less than zero, and in order to be an outlier, you'd have to be less than than negative fifteen. Now that would change if you were using um, maybe plane speeds, right? Some planes, you know, now you're met the data starts moving way over there. So that, and the, the, the range could be, maybe it could be vast. If the range is vast, it might go to the negative, who knows? All right, cool. Let's do this next data set. It tells you the answer, but you can still calculate it. So let's do this data set. Movie running time, find any outliers. Now it tells us what the outlier is gonna be. All right, but let's calculate it. What's the first thing we do in all these statistics problems? Order them. Order them. 96. Oh, nope. 100. I'm making errors here. 5. 8. There's eight data points here, by the way. 96, 100, 105. 110, 120 happens twice. That's the mode. Oh, I missed 115. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then 155. That just looks like it's gonna be an outlier. Okay, here we go. What are our calculations? Eight data points. So the fourth and the fifth need to be averaged out to get the median. The median is going to be um, 112.5. Then we want the lower half here to include the 110 and the upper half to include the 115. Okay, and then we're going to find Q1. It's the average of those is 102.5, Q1. And the average of these is 120, that's Q3. 17.5 is the IQR, okay, because that's the distance between the quartiles, okay, we have to multiply that by one and a half, Twenty six point two five is what we add on. So 26.25 here is 146.25. If you take it off here, 102.5 minus 20, oops, 26.25. Okay, you're gonna get, you're gonna get 76.25 on the lower end. So this is your minimum, this is your maximum. Your lower extreme did not go below the minimum. Your upper extreme did go beyond the maximum. So this is an outlier. How much fun is that? I found it, I, I never knew that there was that 1.5 multiplier to tell <coughs> if something's an outlier or not. Prior to that, I just you just had to make a judgment call whether it was an outlier or not. Questions? Squirrels can only run 20 miles per hour. 
Is that what you, you saw? 12 um, miles per hour. This says 12. Somebody in the yeah, chat. I, I, saw, I mean, I looked it up and uh, it said that they can run 20 miles per hour. Elephants could run fast. I looked up, I thought a cheetah was the fastest animal in the world, but it's the Peregrin falcon. Uh, it's the fastest land animal. Oh, yes. Elephants are fast. To take a dive in the air and use gravity to help it speed up. Yeah, it, you, it, it can go 240 miles per hour when it dives. Yes. If it was riding on land, it would be on a toy floor within a... It's like when you uh, nosedive in like a chest jet or something. That's essentially what it is. Okay, let's look at this next problem. This table shows the calories burned by each activity. So that's what that is. Oh, I guess we're going to find out what burns the most calories. Let's see, swimming, 261. Anything more than that? Swimming the most. Wow. Fat, what does fast crawl mean? Fast crawl? I don't know what that means. Oh. Oh. oh, if you crawl like a bear crawl? Is that what they mean? Like if, you get to, if you try to crawl fast, like a race crawl? Or it could be like an army crawl or something. Look at that. Re soccer, because you're always running. Racquetball, wow, that's good. That's why they had racquetball courts in gyms. Football, basketball, skiing, not as much. Volleyball, not so much. Okay, fine. This table shows the calories burned by each activity. Use measures of variability to describe the data. Okay, go ahead and find all the data yeah, points that we've been finding. This will be the last thing we do, is to find all of these measures. Find everything. Mr. Find Find lower extreme, upper extreme, range, median, Q1, Q3, IQR, um, and go ahead and find any outliers. Mr. Rosenthal? Yes. What was the Q3 for the problem before? 120, I think. 120? Oh, okay. Wait, and the Q1 for the last problem was 102.5? Yes. All right, here, I'm gonna start writing the data. Uh, these are in order. So 84, 150, 183, 210, 202, 22, 28, 234, 261. Okay. Okay, so I have my lower extreme. LE, upper extreme, UE. Okay, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight data points. So four and five, one, two, three, four and five must be averaged out to get the median. So they're 12 apart. So at 216 is going to be the median. Okay. Um, now I have to take the lower half, includes the 210. The upper half includes the 222. Okay. And it's going to be, uh, I'll switch colors now. These two here need to be averaged out. They're 33 apart. So I need 16 and a half. Is it between 30? 16 and a half is half of the 33. So 16 and a half is 166.5 is my Q1. Okay, and here I have 228 and 234. Those are six apart, so I only want to add half of that, three to the 228. So 231 is my Q3. My IQR, I subtract. What's that going to be? So 231.0 minus 166.5. Sixty-four point five. That's my IQR. Not my IQ, hopefully. And then sixty-four point five times one and a half. We're looking for outliers now. Twenty-five, twenty-two, thirty-two, six. Ninety-six point seven five is my um, 
what I'm going to add. Okay, so my maximum, my minimum, 96.75 added to that is 3, 357. Wait, 96. 90 is 350, 357.75. That's my maximum. I do not have any, no, I did something wrong. I added it to 261. I needed to add it to Q3. Sorry. Wait, how do you get the IQR again? It's Q3 minus Q1. You're finding out the range of your core, between your two quartiles. And how do you get the outlier again? I'm doing that now. I'm going to take, what I do is I'm taking my IQR and I'm multiplying it by 1.5. That's what I add to Q3 to see what my maximum value can be. Okay. Um, anything above the maximum value is an outlier. So here we go. 90. So that's going to be 320, 327.75. Now look at this value. That value is not above the maximum, so that is not an outlier, okay? By the way, you can have lots of outliers. We've just been getting cases where there's only one outlier. There could be a thousand outliers over on the right-hand side. If, it just depends on how many data there are and how spread out they are. Okay, now we wanna subtract 96.75 from 166.5. Sixty nine point seven five is the minimum value. I don't have anything below that. OK, so I have no outliers in this data set. Any questions? So to get the maximum, you um, add ninety six point seven five to two sixty one and to get the no, no. To get the maximum, you add it to Q3. If you add it to your upper, if you if you add it to your upper extreme, you'll never get an outlier. If you add anything to your upper extreme, there's not going to be any data more than the upper extreme. Wait, the first quartile is 166.5, and the last quartile is 231, right? Yeah, the upper quartile okay. is 231. I would I wouldn't call it the last quartile. Because tech, technically, the upper extreme. The third quartile. Yeah, the third or the upper. And that's it, folks. There's all this data that you can get from here. Um, the interquartile data is finding if you're in an average range. So half of the data is in the average range because it's in the middle. Middle. OK. So. Um, and that's using the idea of median. But remember median, when we first started yesterday, median was not always the best way to do this. How would we do this in terms of the mean? In aver actually averaging the numbers, would there be something equivalent to an IQR for mean? And the answer is yes. It's called standard deviation, okay? So standard deviation is used often in data sets. If people are within a certain percentage of the mean, then you're within um, you know, they, a certain amount of standard deviations from the mean. So that's what we're going to get into later. Well, let's see what else there is in this lesson. Is there a lot to do or a little bit to do? There's another example and some more stuff to work on. And I think that's it. So we'll table this till tomorrow. And then the homework will be due the following Friday. So I'm not assigning it yet. You are dismissed. Great job. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, you're welcome. Mr. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal, I have a little. Yep. Wait, never mind. Mr. Rosenthal. Mm-hmm. So I have some I, I was doing I was doing one of these problems and it was um n squared minus 7n minus 2 equals zero. Oh, before we do the algebra, um, is there anybody who has any questions about the statistics before I go on to algebra? OK. 
Okay. Oh, Sinister, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm doing the um, homework that I missed right now, and on some of the problems on Who's speaking page right now? Four, on page four hundred twenty-eight. Who is this talking to me? Hmm. It's Tanya. Tanya. Okay, go ahead, Tanya. So, um, the problem is x plus one fourth y equals nine. But then it doesn't say plus, what x or x plus what x plus one fourth y equals, equals nine. And what does it want you to do with that? And then it, it I'm it, I'm supposed to solve the system of equations algebraically, and then the equation under it is x plus y equals twenty one. Okay. So, do you, so which do you, which methods do you want to stay away from? Which methods do you prefer? Do you like elimination? Because they're both in standard form like this. I like elimination. I can make um, everything here negative by multiplying both sides of the equation by negative one. Mm -hmm. That would make this negative. On the left hand side, there's two parts, so you distribute the negative. Like that. Yeah. And then if I add these two equations together, x minus x or plus negative x is gone. Y, one y minus a quarter y is three quarters y. 21 minus nine is 12. Now solve by multiplying by the reciprocal. Uh, okay. Y is 16. Plug y. Oh, okay. If you plug y is 16 in here, 16 plus five is 21. So x is five. So your solution is five sixteen. Okay, thank you. That is oh, all I need. Great. Anybody else have any pre-algebra questions before I do any algebra? All right, Jasper, you got it. All right. So um, it's the equation is n squared minus. Bye. Minus two equals zero. N squared minus what? Seven N. Minus two equals zero? Yeah, and... Um, what did they ask you to do? They said solve by completing the square, and I, and I did it. it. I got N equals seven plus or minus the square root of 14 and one fourth divided by two. Let me see. Okay, so I'm going to add two. But on the answer key, it says that it's wrong. I don't know if there's like a like. Well, let's see. Something that I missed. You're gonna cut that in half and make it seven over two, mm -hmm. which is three and a half. Or you can you can make it you can leave it as seven over two, and then when you square seven over two, what do you get? Forty nine over four. Yeah. So I'm gonna add forty nine over four to both sides. So, um, 12 and one, one fourth. So, but first we say this becomes n minus seven over two squared. Mm -hmm. And that's equal to, let's see, this is eight over four is two. So then I add those and I get 57 over four. Take the, take the square root of both sides. And because this is an un, square root of an unknown squared, then the unknown here under my hand could be negative or positive. And you can, when you square it, you get the same result. So this is plus or minus. So you get n minus 7 over 2 is equal to plus or minus root 57 over 2, because the square root of 4 is 2. Then I add 7 over 2 to both sides to get that. Oh. Hmm. The middle of the parabola is three and a half. X equals three and a half is the middle because that's your negative B over two A is the seven over the two. Yeah. And then on along the X axis, the, um, the first X intercept to the right of the vertex, uh, the right of the axis is root 57 over two to the right and then root 57 over two to the left, right? 
Oh, because I put it into. So this is that this location is at three, or seven over two, or three and a half, and then this distance here is root fifty-seven over two positive, and this is negative root 57 over 2 from 7 over 2. Gives you this point, and that one gives you that point, graphically. But I, I mean, this is extra, but this is the... Oh, because, oh so... Because I put it into... Because hmm, I put it into 14 over... 14 and 1 fourth, so should I have, like, because, like, there's a square root of... Where, where did you put it at 14 and 1 fourth? Um, because... Where? Which, what number did you turn into 14 and a quarter? 57 and, uh, 57 over 4. Oh, you turned that into 14 and a quarter and tried to take the square root, but it didn't let you do that because, I mean, you, you need to keep it in improper form so that you can take the square root of the denominator. Yeah, so like in problems like this, I should just keep it in um, a fraction. Keep, yep, keep it in proper. Okay. Now, if you want to take a calculator and find out what the square root of 57 is, you can get this all into decimal form rounded to some column, like to the tenths, and then your answer wouldn't be wrong. Your answer is not wrong, it's just not in the form you're going to see it in the book. Yeah. This is the simplest radical form. Any other questions? Um, hmm. I'm doing one right now. But I guess it's going to go back into, because it looks like it's going to be the same root. Same kind of thing. Hmm. Um, oh, I'm doing 20, I'm doing 24 because I accidentally put it as 22, but I'm doing 20. Oh, so yes, I do have a question. Okay. So, I am on 24 and it is 2x squared plus 3x minus 17 equals 0. Okay. And how do they want you to solve it? They just, uh, by completing the square. Okay. Um, I'll get the 17 over to the other side first. There, you could divide by two first, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Divide everything by two to get rid of the coefficient here. Oh, so you just get rid of the coefficient. Yep. Okay. But you do it like you you divide by two on like Well, I'm gonna divide this coefficient by two to get three three over four. You know dividing by two is just multiplying the denominator by two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's three quarters squared is nine sixteenths is what I'm gonna add to both sides. And then whatever this was divided by two, three quarters, right? That's what this is, x plus 3 quarters squared. And then here I need to make that 8. So times by 4, right? No, I need to make it 16. Times by 8 makes this 16. So I need that. Okay, so that's 80 and 50. 136. This 136 plus the 9 is 145 over 16. But look at that. You have a 16 there. Isn't that nice when you take the square root? Mm -hmm. See what's going to happen? Plus or minus square root of 145 over 4. It matches that denominator. Yeah. Subtract it. You get negative 3 plus or minus root 145 over 4. Notice it. It's in the form of the quadratic formula, right? Negative b plus or minus the square root of this is whatever you would have gotten from b squared minus 4ac all over what 2a would have been. So like, look at A, A is 2. 
For a problem that was x equals 5 plus or minus the square root of, 20, of uh, 29, it was just like divided by 1, basically. So like 2ac would be on the bottom, 2ac or... Wait, I'm not following you. Are you in this problem still? Um, I was talking, well, yeah, I'm on this. So it's in this form of the quadratic formula. That's what, if you look at it, look at it. It looks just like the quadrat, what you would get when you plugged it into the quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, because I was just having trouble with like how to how to like perform how to do this, but you just divide by two on both sides to get rid of the coefficient. Oh yeah, yeah, up here, yes. And then you, and yeah. Okay, so I yeah, so like now I know just to put it in like to put it in fraction form. Yeah. And then because I was like a little bit confused on how to, but like it was fourteen and one for, for back to twenty fourteen and one fourth. So the form that I put it was like. It's not incorrect. It's just not simple. It's not going to help you get it the problem in simplest radical form. Mm -hmm. If you leave it improper, you get that perfect square denominator that you can take the square root of so that you can then combine it with the fraction that's on the left-hand side, like this, when you subtract this fraction that was in the other problem on both sides, the denominators will be the same because you were able to take the square root of that denominator. And then you put the denominator divided by the whole And you can put, write them over a common denominator, which is how the book is going to express the answer. Oh, because three fourths and and this have the same denominator. Yeah. But when you had this as fourteen and a quarter inside the square root, you were never going to get a common denominator by writing it in that form. Because then it would be like over one, and then you would have to put it into that form. You would have to put it into. Well, yeah, you could multiply by four on the bottom and the top, and you'd have four radical square root of fourteen and a quarter. Or four, and then it would have it would look different, but it would have the same value though. So if you were trying to find the value in decimal form, it wouldn't matter. The way you're doing it is not incorrect. You're just not putting it in the form they are putting it in. The publisher. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. That's it. Uh, wait, hold on. What's the time? I think I can do a little bit more. So if you want. thirteen four is we just want you. Oh. So substituting into the quadratic formula. Yeah. That's in that's the next one. That's the next lesson. Okay. So, oh. I substitute when I'm finding the vertex is negative b over 2a. Once I have that value, I plug that into the quadrat. I substitute that in for x to find y. Mm. And that is, that is so that I can locate the vertex the exact coordinate of the vertex. I start by finding the x coordinate of the vertex is at negative b over 2a. And then once I have that, I plug it in to find the y coordinate. And so you're using substitution in the quadratic to do that. Yeah, they talk about the discriminant. Yeah, okay, so the discriminant is what's inside the square root. Yeah. This is the discriminant. Discriminant. And they talk about the graphing and the solutions. 
Yeah, if the discriminant is zero, then you're adding and subtracting zero is only gonna be one answer. That means there's only one X intercept. If this is any positive value, then adding it is gonna be different than subtracting it. Yeah, that's an example in here. Yeah, and if it's negative, it's because it never touches the X axis. Just like parallel lines, the, syst the system of parallel lines has no solution because the solution is where they touch. And by definition, they don't touch. So when they say solve using the quadratic formula, do they just want you to solve by completing the square or is- If they don't say complete the square, I would solve by factoring. And if not by factoring, I would solve by the quadratic formula. Because one of the problems are x squared minus 4x equals 21. X squared. Minus 4x equals 21. And it says solve using the quadratic formula. And at that point, would you- I subtract the 21. It would be, it would, yeah, yeah. No, it was um, x squared minus 4x equals 21. Yeah, and so I subtract 21 on both sides. Set up your quadratic formula. Here are the b's. Here are the a's. Here are, here's the c. Okay, b is negative 4. Okay, a is 1. c is negative 21. Um, Here you get positive 4. And this is what x is equal to. Okay. These are the x intercepts that you're finding. Okay. And plus or minus, here we go, 16 plus 84 is 100. And that came out nicely. So it's uh, x could be two answers. It's 4 plus 10 over 2, and it's 4 minus 10 over 2. And those are the x intercepts. Yeah, and so 14 over 2 is 7. This is negative 6 over 2 is negative 3. Now, this was factorable. Oops. 1 and 21, 3 and 7. Okay, so 3 and negative 7. So I would have had x plus 3, x minus 7 equals 0. And then you would have said, oh, x can be negative 3, 7, which is what I got here. Oh, I don't want parentheses here. It's not a coordinate. That's because it equals 0. Yeah. So I like, fact, I like solving by factoring is easier than setting all this up. When you cannot factor, then I set it up, and you can get the answer that way. I like this when your answer ends up being a radical. Mm -hmm. Your answer is a radical. You're not going to be able to do it by factoring. Then this is the way to go. And you put your answer and round it to whatever you want to round it to. I'm going to put my bookmark right there because I want to come back to that. Okay. Great. Okay. Yep. I'm going to try these problems in my free time. Great. And I'll okay. come back tomorrow. All right. Very good. Have a good day and I'll see you tomorrow. You too. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Anybody else have a question for me? No? Oh, thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. You are welcome. See you tomorrow.